Captain. Good evening. I hope everyone is, I know everyone is having a great time because I can sense that it's palpable even up here on the stage. You know, when I think of Nature Bridge, there's one particular memory that stands out for me. And I think the word memory is not powerful enough to describe the feeling that is created in me when I have this image of this young African-American man who was brought to Yosemite for his first National Park experience. And he certainly had no idea what was around the corner. He had no idea what the sun would show him, what the sun would reveal to him when he arrived in Yosemite Valley. How many of you remember the first time you were revealed to Yosemite Valley when it was revealed to you? You know, it's like what uh, I remember reading about the 19th century when, when someone, a visitor, first saw Yosemite Valley from Inspiration Point, and they had seen it, and they had started to return along the trail, and someone who had not yet seen the view saw them and saw the look, the, that rapture that was on their face, and they said, did you see it? What did you see? What did you see? And the person just looked at them and said, I saw God. And Yosemite is a place where the divine is tangible in this world, and you can see it. Yes, it's science, but it is something beyond science. It is beyond the human imagination. It is something only linked with the soul itself. And it's tangible, it is palpable, and you can feel it, and it is in your gut, it is in your soul, it is in your spirit. And I saw it in the eyes of that young African-American man who had no idea a place like Yosemite existed because it was not taught to him. It was not showed to him. There were no discussions about the national parks for him. And so he was not prepared for what he was about to experience. And I recognized the look. He stood there at Lower Yosemite Fall against the railing, and there were clouds just drifting over him from the base of that falls, and there was just the sound of thunder in the air. And up above, you could see that blue-white light of the falls peeling over the edge of the world. And I went up to him and I said, well, what do you think? And he just looked at me and he said, and I quote, I had no idea that such beauty existed. And I knew what he meant because I grew up in Detroit, not the suburbs of Detroit. I thought about that at the time. Why are we in the suburbs? <laughs> I grew up in the inner city. And where I grew up, no one discussed national parks. No one talked about the beauty of the earth. They didn't really exist for me. And I said something similar in the Ken Burns film. And it's similar because it was so true. It's my own history. But there was something different about me compared to my classmates in Bagley Elementary, Hampton Junior High, and Cass Tech. My classmates only knew Detroit. And what I'm saying when you only knew Detroit, that's like saying you only know Compton, you only know Hunter's Point, you only know Crenshaw, you only know the south side of L. That's all you know. And it is, your world is a few miles over there, or a few blocks over there, a few blocks in that direction. And beyond those streets, you don't go. That's someone else's place. So for that young man, to find Yosemite, it changed him. It changed him in such a profound way that we think when we see a place like Yellowstone, the Grand Canyon, Zion, Arches, Canyonlands, Bryce, Wrangell St. Elias, we think, isn't this beautiful? But for him, it was more than beautiful. It was his spirit that was being transformed. You folks are in the business of transforming the human spirit. And sometimes we don't know that. We don't use language like that. We, the guides don't take people along saying, is your spirit being transformed right now? <laughs> My spirit's being transformed quite deeply. I'm just wondering how your spirit is doing. <laughs> that sounds a bit awkward. But when you see people in Yosemite, it is obvious what's happening to them. At some deep, some profound level, something is Re being rekindled in them. And for me, seeing a fellow African-American entranced with the natural world is beyond profound because we descend from a people for whom that respect and that reverence was damaged because of slavery. So when you take an inner city kid who is Latino, Hispanic, African American, Asian American, you take a kid who has no prior exposure, no prior experience, 
of, tr of a transcendent place. They are not prepared for it. And so when it hits them, it is like a semi running over their soul. And the irony is we all are part of a culture where there is a cultural perception that people who look like me cannot connect with places like that. If you are a human being and you cannot connect with Yosemite, that's called a coma. <laughs> and no one on my, in my family is on life support. But no one or very few in my family have ever received or felt a reception of an invitation that the national parks belong to them because we had this whole history, this whole legacy, not just with slavery, but with Jim Crow and who's out there that may not want people who look like me in their environment. And so there's fear and there's anxiety and there should not be fear and anxiety with the Grand Canyon. There should not be trepidation with Mount Rainier. There should not be any kind of issue of concern about your safety when you're in a place that makes you feel that you're more alive than you've ever been in your life. But that is the case for some people. So that's why I wrote to Oprah. <laughs> How could I imagine? She'd write, she didn't just write back, she showed up with a helicopter. <laughs> Most people don't show up in Yosemite with helicopters. And she filmed her experience in Yosemite because I recognize that I am a park ranger, I'm a federal servant, and I can only do so much. Boy, I need someone who really has the command of media who can convince people that this is a good idea. That's why I wrote to her. I wrote to her in the hope that other young men and women, like that young man that stood at the railing at Lower Yosemite Fall, could be transformed by the experience of a place that is their birthright. I'll say that again, their birthright. <laughs> that young man and the young woman, women that were with him that were culturally diverse, were claiming their inheritance. And if you come, as I do, from a blue-collar, working-class family, it, the, the whole notion and conversation about when will my inheritance kick in <laughs> does not usually occur. <laughs> my grandfather worked for Ford Motor Company on an assembly line for 40 years. My father's a Vietnam vet, Korean War vet, served his country, didn't die, made it home, raised a family never visited a national park. But I believed deep within myself that he was fighting for Yellowstone. He was fighting for the Grand Canyon. And all the men who served with him and women were fighting for all that is American. And for me, there's nothing more American than a national park. And so for you to take these kids and allow them on that bridge of their own imagination to experience a place like Yosemite, like Yellowstone, why aren't you getting awards all the time? Why is that not recognized as being as powerful as it should be? Because no American should be told, you're an American and you own this. They should just know. That's already a problem. You should know that Yosemite belongs to you and Yellowstone belongs to you. But now that we have that bridge, that transformation can happen. And it happened for me, not through Nature Bridge. The reason why I'm standing here before you is not because of an organization. It's called Good Parenting. My father was stationed in Germany. And he took my, my mom and my brother and I to Germany. We lived in a little town called Kantwick. Don't worry, I, I, they told me I have three hours. <laughs> and I, I was in, ki in kindergarten in Germany, and one particular weekend, my dad and mom took my brother and I to Berchtesgaden, Eagle's Nest, high up in the Bavarian Alps where Hitler had this stronghold. And I, I didn't know about Hitler. I was in kindergarten. I didn't know about World War II. I was in kindergarten. I didn't know about the Third World. I was in kindergarten. <laughs> and there we were. And I stood there with my mother and father on either side, and I remember to this day looking down beneath me, thousands of feet, and seeing clouds. That doesn't happen in Detroit. <laughs> it doesn't happen in Chicago. 
and there were clouds above me. And I still remember the hand of my mother and father because it was the only warmth in the world were their hands holding on to me. And I was high up in this mountain, and I was scared and exhilarated at the same time. And that is called, in a John Muir, Muir-like way, a baptism of the mountains. And I was baptized by the Bavarian Alps, an inner city kid from Detroit. And I never left those mountains. And from that point on, whenever, I, whenever there was something on television, anyone here watch television? <laughs> whenever there was something here on television and I saw mountains, I'd say to my mom, were those the mountains? Is that where we were? She would say, no, no, those are the Rockies. Oh, Were those the mountains, that one right there? No, no, those are, that's the Sierra Nevada. Oh, OK, OK. Then there was something about Germany. Yes, those are the mountains. <laughs> but the result of that experience is that every time I go to any mountain range anywhere in the world, it's a homecoming. I was in China, part of the second Park Service delegation to China. Never been to China before, but when we were there at Yulongzhuishan, Jade Dragon Snow Mountain, I felt kinship with those mountains. That was the gift that was given to me by my parents. That was the legacy that was bestowed upon me. That was my inheritance. So I'm here because I've been enriched by gift that was given to me by my father, who is no longer here, but bless his soul, he lived long enough to see me and Ken Burns in the National Parks, America's Best Idea. <laughs> and you know what, people can, people can give you awards and they can say, you know, you really can talk. <laughs> but when your, your mother is looking at you, the person who brought you into this world, and she's looking at you, and she doesn't say anything, and she just holds your hand real tight, and she just says, Boy, I'm so proud of you. That's the greatest award I've ever received. And that award wouldn't have happened if it hadn't been for my parents and if it hadn't been for my first supervisor in Yellowstone National Park who told me I was doing a good job. And I held on to that. And that was over 20 years ago. So all this is about is not me. It's about we. It's about helping those who come after us. It's about a legacy. Everyone here, we're all part of that legacy. And you know, what did that, remember that statement that Margaret Mead said, never doubt that a small committed group of people can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Well, what about a very large group of committed people? <laughs> I think that's much more powerful. And as I look out here, I see a very large group of committed people. And I think that changing the world is entirely and completely within our grasp. And not only that, we have to. Because the parks, the places that we love, depend on the passion of the young people who follow us. And the, the demographics of the United States are changing. It's a different America 30, 40, 20 years from now. There's already six states that are minority, majority cultures. So we have to make those changes. And what I'm saying is, we're all up for the challenge, aren't we? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, I, I don't think they heard you in St. Louis. We're all up for the challenge, aren't we? That, that was good, but there are people in Harlem that didn't quite hear that. Are we up for the challenge? That, that's getting closer, but you know, there's someone in Hunter's Point that no one ever took them. No one ever took them to the ocean. They don't even know the ocean is there. And are we going to take them to the ocean? Are we going to take them to Point Reyes? I can't hear you. Are you committed? Do national parks belong to everyone? And it is our power and within our power and within our grace to spread that joy and that passion beyond this room to everyone who does not feel that passion, for everyone to feel, I own something. I own this. I'm an American, and it belongs to me. Does that sound good? All right. Because I never heard that growing up in Detroit. So thank you. It's been about 20 years, but I've been waiting to hear that. <laughs> so I'm going to go off, step off the stage now, and I'm, I'm thinking about uh, claiming my inheritance, but you know what? I realize I don't have to. It's already mine. Thank you.